Good afternoon. Now, I hope that many of you uh, recognize me from this morning. Uh, by way of quick reintroduction, a decade at Capital One, a decade as a venture capitalist, and now I like to say I'm a bit of an event planner uh, for a, a little show in Las Vegas around InsureTech. Um, this was originally going to be a, uh, a panel, but I think it's turned into a nice fireside chat. Fabrice, would you care to introduce yourself? Thank you. Thank you very much, Karibu. So my name is Fabrice Erfati. I'm a partner at Ignia Fund. We've been in Mexico for the last 12 years. We've started investing in venture capital the same year that the iPhone got into the market. So that gives you an idea of how much technology we had back then. Uh, we've uh, done two funds, $200 million in total, and we've been investing our second fund since um, 2015. We've done 28 investments in uh, half of the portfolio is in fintech, which is, is interesting because we started even with our first fund, and, and I think most of what we're going to discuss today, it's going to be around those same concepts in many ways, and, um, and the rest are marketplaces and software as a service platforms. Great. So, um, since it's just the two of us, and we're both experienced VCs, um, I thought maybe we should make this a little bit more relaxed, especially it's, it's mid-late afternoon, you're probably getting a little tired. So, I think we're going to just have this be lighthearted, interesting, a conversation between two VCs. And maybe to help that, if, if folks from the back there could help bring some drinks for us. Yeah, that'd be nice. That would be great. There is for everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Gracias. Muchas gracias. So, uh, Fabrice, what do you like the most about being a VC? Well, <laughs> esa es su salud, eh? No crean que no. Um, what I like about being a VC, um, I can tell you what I don't like first. So, I don't like fundraising. Mm. And actually, I don't like fundraising like probably most of the um, the guys are entrepreneurs around here and that they go through the hurdles of convincing VCs which they think they know everything and they actually don't know everything. So what I do like about VC is that it gives me the, the opportunity to be really in touch with new business models, trying to understand and put my, hand, my head around new technologies, discussing things like InsureTech, for example, right now, which is really incipient right now in Mexico and in Latin America, and in many ways, working with the entrepreneurs, partnering with the entrepreneurs, which is another paradigm. No? Sometimes you think that the venture capitalist becomes like the boss of the entrepreneur, while successful um, VCs, we actually partner with them and help them develop their business plans and, and, and achieve the potential that they have. No? So I think it, in many ways, it's a, it's a business that is very related to people, mm -hmm. and I love that part. Yeah. I really I, like that. I, I always um, found myself feeling like it is my job to give input, right? to give suggestions, Correct. to give my perspective as I see it. Yeah. Um, and, and it's not my job to make the decisions. Correct. I don't have that authority, and I don't really want that responsibility as a VC, especially across a portfolio of companies. I agree. That's what the management, that's what the CEO's job is. Yep. Uh, it is the expectation that they will listen to me, <laughs> meaning that they will hear what I have to say. They'll treat it as more than just a whim. But if they decide to do something the opposite of what my suggestion is, I'm good with that. I agree. Right? Uh, and if I'm not good with that, then, it's, then, I made the, then I made a mistake years ago in writing the check in the first place. I agree, 100%. I think um, I was listening to the conversations that were prior uh, to this one, and it was really interesting because I am seeing a lot of things uh, very similar to when FinTech started in Mexico. Um, a lot of very eager entrepreneurs, a huge opportunity, an underserved market, people that actually are kind of reluctant of using uh, insurance products, but a new set of consumers that are willing to try new things, young people that are very, well, actually, the lady that, at some of the pitches, I was kind of getting sad because she said that millennials were something around 28 to 30 and something. 
And I was, I, I'm not even even close to the millennial part, no? I'm actually post-millennial a lot. And, um, but that, that, those business models, which now they have platforms that are helping to those businesses to grow, to accelerate even more than what we saw in the first days of FinTech. Mm -hmm. And now we have proof that FinTech actually works. And that's the important part. And that gives you some conviction, it does. right? To say, okay, Definitely. well, I, I had some nice wins on the FinTech side, and SureTech kind of resembles FinTech in some important ways. Yes. I bet I'll be good at InsureTech too. And lessons learned also, no, mm -hmm. in the process. Yeah. Of things you want to be, to be a way of, things that are a concern for you in some, in, in some negotiations you're entering to. So I think it's, it's a great moment to be starting businesses in this, in this particular vertical. Mm -hmm. um, I, may, I, I may need to wait for you to have more beer before I ask this, but... Uh, I'm actually okay. pretty much ahead of you. All right. So, oh, challenge for you. So, um, uh, other than yourself and your firm, right. who's the best InsureTech or FinTech investor in Mexico or LATAM? Who do you respect the most, or when you hear they're doing a deal, you, you want to see if you can get in alongside? Wow. It's a tough question. Yeah, I need more beer for that. <laughs> um, no, I... I didn't ask you who's the, who's the VC where if you hear they're doing a deal, you're not going to go along. No, and, and, and I, think, I think the jury's still out on that one. I wouldn't even say that Ignia is the best fintech investor right now. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is, as you, are, you obviously know this, the cycle hasn't been completed yet. We need exits to know that the VC was able to support the entrepreneur and take him all the way up until there's a successful exit. So we haven't been there yet. Um, I, I would say that in general, um, we do respect all of our, of, of our uh, you know, colleagues in many ways. Um, They're your competition too, though, right? They are our competition. Sometimes. No, they are all the time. But we need to be able to work together in many ways because the funding risk in an, in, in an environment as Mexico and Latin America in general, but if you compare it for, with Brazil, for example, Mexico is even a higher uh, funding risk. You need to have people with deep pockets around the table to make sure that the companies continue to go to grow, to acquire customers. And um, so there's competition, but at the same time, there's a lot of collaboration uh, mm -hmm. happening. Um, to answer directly your questions, um, I would say, for example, in the fintech space, QED, and not, it's not because you're here, um, <laughs> but it's one of our partners that we have been working with uh, very well. In Latin America, I would say Monashis, for example, it's a, it's a great partner. Um, uh, CASEC, it's also a great fund. In Mexico, I would say the guys from Dila, the guy from Dalus, uh, all VPs. The, Something that has happened in Mexico in the last 12 years is there has been a migration to quality in the, in, the, in the venture investing space. So there was a lot of very small funds that, that actually came because of some public policies within them. And some of them don't have the ability to continue to raise other funds. So they, they kind of built a portfolio and they are there. But the names that you hear in the industry are the ones that have been also you know, resilient enough and being able to find pocket of investors that continue to support their business plans as VC investors. And, and those ones are, are, I think, great partners. Well, all the entrepreneurs in the audience should make sure they take note of the VCs that Fabrice just listed. Because yeah, right? well, if it's sort of like peer review, right? If, if uh, exactly. VC is saying, these are the ones that I really want to pay attention to when they're making a move. Right? And if at some point somebody hears someone saying something bad about, about <laughs> us, don't believe them. It's not true. So I think a lot about ecosystems and right. building ecosystems and a lot of the questions I've gotten today and talking yeah. with people about, you know, where is the Mexican FinTech and SureTech ecosystem? Right. What's it going to take to, to build it? I thought about that actually a lot in the context back when we were launching a conference, Correct. actually, because like, who do you need to get yep. to show up in order, right. whether it's at a conference or in the economy, sort of, in order to like make it actually work, to get Correct. the flywheel spinning? And, you know, there, there's three buckets there. There's the VCs, right. bring in the capital, the risk capital. Correct. There's the entrepreneurs 
who are actually doing something for a living, right? Building stuff. Yeah. And there's the incumbents from the industry. Correct. In the end, you need all three of those to be pointed in the right direction. All of them need to be present yes. if you're going to have a successful ecosystem. Yes. Um, which is most important in the in the context here of Mexico? Yeah. Um, you know, and, and I don't know if the answer is different between fintech and insure tech, but no, no, I, I, I'm not sure. I would say it's different between the, those two verticals. I think at, at the center of everything, in in our view, in our institutional view, and in my own personal view as an investor, I think the entrepreneur is the most important part. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is because they are the ones that will define what are the needs that need to be served. Mm -hmm. They will provide the product. They will pivot the product so that it actually gets to a point in which it, has, it fits the needs of the market. And if they do that right, they will have the investment side along them, and they will provoke thoughts from the incumbents. But you know, there's a lot of experiments, and I've been, trying, I've been working a lot with uh, insurance companies that they want to, you know, they, they need to develop their, their um, innovation department, no? So basically they think that if they put two guys in WeWork around the block and they send it to all the conferences, there you go, you have your innovation and they, it's just gonna happen like that, no? And the biggest difference in my mind between that model and what actually happens in reality about, about an entrepreneur is who is really willing to take a risk. Mm -hmm. And the guy that has a paycheck and that works for an insurance company, just by definition, he's not willing to take that risk. Yeah. And he will get penalized if he actually loses money, while the entrepreneur has a complete different way of looking at things. For the entrepreneur losing money in many ways, it's a learning. For the other guy, it's, and, and I don't mean it in a, in a disrespectful way, I think it's important to have those interfaces between big incumbents and the entrepreneurs, but the big risk is to think and to believe really that developing an innovation um, initiative just by two guys in the WeWork and everything, just gonna do the trick, which is not gonna happen. Yeah, I, I really try to be a student of organizational behavior. Mm -hmm. um, the most useless class in business school, but the most important sort of aspect of business in so many ways. And it is so interesting to see how hard it is, it is. particularly for a successful large company, oh, yeah. right, to do that kind of innovation. Yeah. Uh, and, and then I think there's a really interesting question around when they, you know, there's the whole build by partner, Correct. which I think actually is, oh, yeah. is very in front on both FinTech and InsureTech. But, you know, the buy side is really interesting to me mm -hmm. because it's really hard to actually have acquisitions work, to yeah. have them actually oh, successful. Yeah. This is one of my, my sort of themes I've been thinking about is like, yep. you know, one of two things typically happens. Either the antibodies mm -hmm. right, sort of come out yep. from the, the acquiring organizations surround the really creative, you know, rocket ship successful startup that they just acquired and, and, and ensures that there's nothing that they can actually accomplish. Yeah. Um, that yeah. is the norm. That usually happens. Yeah, it happens a lot. The other, which I think is what acquirers usually want to happen, is that the startup serves as a kind of retrovirus. Mm -hmm. right? It sort of injects some unique different DNA which replicates itself throughout the acquiring mother organization. Or I think there's a third option, which is basically just leave it there. You do an investment, mm -hmm. you, you leave the company over there, and just, you just let it gain its own traction and becoming what it's meant to become. And then probably you do some type of you know, you know, joint venture or something like that. But in, in many ways, at least in my mind, is the way to do it because you actually have Value, economic value creation, because you did an investment and the company continued to grow, and you did the right bet, to mm -hmm. put it some way. And on the other hand, you had this product, product development uh, ability of this startup that is actually happening and that you can take advantage of it, because you're an investor into the company. But, but, um, 
but it doesn't happen so much, mm -hmm. and we clearly don't want to upset the sponsors of these type <laughs> of things, so we need to be really careful. But Well, I, I do have a solution. I, I, I've, I've, I have figured out what makes those retrovirus kind of approaches okay. work. Um, uh, it is where, in my humble view, it's where the CEO of the acquired company actually gets more responsibility and authority Correct. than just the acquired company. That's so um, a couple of years ago, Walmart bought a m sort of seemingly massively overvalued e-commerce startup called Jet.com. Correct. And they not only kept the CEO to have authority over Jet.com, but they gave him authority over Walmart.com, okay. which you know dwarfed uh, Jet.com. Yeah. So that he actually was able to sort of expand his influence uh, and sort of insert the, the e-commerce DNA into the mother acquiring organization. Right. That's what I really look for to see. Actually, another example, um, some years ago, PayPal mm -hmm. bought uh, Braintree, oh, yeah. payments company, competitor yeah. to Stripe. And over time, the CEO of Braintree was moved to be the, the COO of PayPal. So when you expand the authority of the acquired CEO, that's actually the recipe for sort of replicating the, the winning DNA to a broader swath of the organization. So, so that in, in some ways leads you to think about the leadership capabilities of the entrepreneur, mm -hmm. which I think it's important. No? The, the fact that he can actually connect with people that are in other organization and actually make it work. but. In my experience, I haven't seen so many entrepreneurs having that, that edge. Mm -hmm. And I think in many ways also what happens is that we still have a very young ecosystem. Yeah. And there are a lot of other of things that need to happen within what we're doing right now to get to that point. And, and we're starting to see, for example, second and third time entrepreneurs, mm -hmm. which is super great because those guys are accelerating their businesses much quicker mm -hmm. than the first time around. And they are becoming investors and mentors. And to people that are here listening to what we're saying, which, uh, again, salute. Thank you for joining us. Um, finding mentors uh, is very relevant in the process. I think it's not specifically about InsureTech. And the problem is that there are not so much successful mentors developing um, InsureTech in endeavors, but making sure that you have someone that actually helps you navigate the, 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 the seas of uncertainty mm -hmm. on the, on the, enver in the uh, entrepreneurship um, adventure is super important. The, the, another thing I was going to tell you is, um, since we're just us and Old friends, becoming you know. friends and all of that, um, I have four boys. I have four kids. They're fantastic. Um, How old? So Patrick is 22. Uh, Alexis is 19, Andre is 13, and Paul is 12. And obviously, the most complicated questions always come from the, sm the, the young one. No, mm -hmm. Paul is always making tough questions. And one of the things he was telling me is, since you have so much money that you're <laughs> investing, how come we don't have a bigger house? And how come we don't have better trips and all of that? And, and I was thinking about it because the type of leap of faith that we are asking CEOs of big corporations to do when they invest in a, in, in, a, in a startup is the same thing we do. And we don't get rich immediately. I hope at some point I'll be able to say to, to Paul in particular, <laughs> you see, now we have a big car or we have a big house or we were able to pay your college or something like that. But what I'm trying to say is this is a tough business because decisions that you do right now in investing in a company, the results are five, seven, or even 10 years down the road. And for a CEO of a big corporation to be able to do those type of leap of faith requires a lot of, an, of endorsement of the organization. And the problem is, and, and, and that was one of the main points I wanted to make in this conversation, insurance companies are eager to go into the startup world, but the guys in the startup world need to be really careful, careful not to get in bed with a gorilla, because, well, you kind of imagine how can, that can end. Um, 
¿no? If he gets too romantic, <laughs> it can be painful and not for the gorilla. But what I'm trying to say is, at some point, you will be asked to deliver results very quickly, and that creating financial results is not the same thing to create economic uh, value. And that is something that can kill, and that's one of the biggest risks I see in, insur in insure tech right now, is so many people with deep pockets wanted to buy, wanting to buy and, uh, startups, that is a problem. So when, uh, when I went a long way, right? Oh, that's Sorry fine. That's fine. And everything. But yeah. Uh, uh, w when I talk, I've got two sons, mm. 15 and 17, and and when I talk with them about money, right? I tell them, you know, your mom and I, we're doing pretty well. You guys, you are dirt poor. <laughs> you like barely anything. So you better work hard. <laughs> exactly. Because go yeah. we'll wash the car. Yeah. <laughs> so, so tell me, tell me about the deal right. that you didn't do, and in hindsight, oh, hindsight is great, isn't it? In hindsight, you wish you did. Oh, there's a lot. <laughs> there's a lot of deals that... Uh, Name names if you can. For example, at some point, we were presented by, with Confio, mm -hmm. which is a fintech company here in Mexico, and we said, no, it's not for us, and we're not going to do it right now, and because we were, we were coming from a very traumatic uh, experience, um, and, 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 and really traumatic experience because it may seem that this is about putting money into the companies, but again, our business is about creating relationships. And when you have write-offs, it's much more than a company that just dies. I mean, you see your, friend, your friends, the one you've been working with, just looking at their, you know, what they were betting all of it, just going down the drain. And that is really painful. And we were, we were probably the first investor in fintech in Mexico. We invested in a company called Mimoni, which um, did uh, personal loans, algorithmic loans, online acqu acquisition and all of that. We were actually, um, we got uh, an option to, to buy the company by, by a big bank in Mexico. Um, they actually came into the cap structure with an investment. Then they decided not to invest anymore. Um, so it just didn't happen, and we pivoted into other things. But the thing is, we were really hurt about, you know, the personal loan space. And just about that time, just came uh, David and his team presenting Confio. We were like, we're not doing that anymore. <laughs> and um, turns out they just did it, did it right. I mean, they still need to create that, you know, s closing the circle and becoming uh, that big success, but they have everything to go there. Yeah. So that's, for example, one of the... Of if, the if it came through again, do you think you'd make a different decision this time around? Are you like, With the information, no, it's, it's the right, it was the right decision at the time, yeah. and I, I, I wouldn't change the decision heuristic. Ah, that's a, that, you've been asking questions. You should have prepared me for that. Um, Much more interesting. Than yeah, that. absolutely. <laughs> that was the beer. Actually, nothing is an accident, right? Um, but the beer is not an accident. <laughs> Um, I think that with the information that we had at that time, we probably would have gone the same path. Now, obviously, it's, it's, it's easier to be the quarterback uh, in Tuesday morning, right? Looking at the games and saying, this should have happened, you know? Um, I think, and, and, and I was talking to you about this while we were uh, backstage, one of the things we we learned to focus and that the entrepreneurs didn't have it like something so relevant in our first conversations where you need economics. And probably if we have seen more in detail the unit economics of Confio at that moment in time, probably our, our, um, our opinion would have been different. But we were not focusing on that. We were focusing, we were grieving. We were in the process of just, you know, leaking our wounds yeah. and saying this has been really painful. Um, we're going to do other things and not, not financial services for the time being. No. The, the VCs have a big emotional component to them, a very behavioral economics mm -hmm. component. It's right. why when, it, when an entrepreneur asked me, like, you know, what kind of VC should I find you know, to, to write my next check, my answer was always, find a VC who's recently had a big win right. in something that looks kind of like what you are, <laughs> but is no longer conflicted. Because right. they're going to feel, whether right or just luck, that they know what they're doing in that space, and they'll have the conviction yeah. to write the checks. 
or that you've gone through that painful process, process so much times yeah. that you understand that it's part of the business. Thank and you. that actually the, the business may go sour, but the people don't die. I mean, they're going to do it again, and they're going to do it better because they have on their back the scarves of what they actually lost. Yeah. So um, that's actually what's been happening to us because when we started our second fund, a decision was we shouldn't be investing so aggressively anymore, or we should be doing tickets, big, bigger tickets, because there's le less risk there, because the companies <laughs> are more mature. And we decided, no, we're going to do exactly the same. Mm -hmm. And right now, right now our, our portfolio, our, our second fund portfolio, is generating a 30% IRR, which, which is fantastic yes. for, for a VC fund. But, um, but it was because we decided we were in the right track. We were resilient, I think, in many ways. And we are also entrepreneurs in this business. No? Yeah. I'll tell you my own sob story just recently. Um, so fairly big news in US insure tech, uh, Prudential, a yep. huge uh, life insurance annuity company, uh, announced that they were buying a three-year-old startup called Assurant, mm -hmm. and a uh, company in, in uh, the Seattle area, for two and a half billion dollars, with a billion dollar earnout on top of that. All right. <laughs> um, and so that's, a, that's one of the larger exits, actually in fintech as well as insuretech. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so it's, it's got a real, like, it's actually great for the US insuretech ecosystem, right. because now it's like, question is answered, can exactly. you get multi-billion dollar exits? It can yep. happen. Can it be done in a company that's three years old? Yeah. Um, so I yep. still remember chatting with the founders of it at the first InsureTech Connect three years ago. Okay. And I, I had them and myself and our managing partner in a room right. talking with them about, you know, maybe we should invest. And they didn't really think of it as a pitch meeting, so it didn't go the way that maybe I, I thought it would go. And right. we, we were, it was all totally cordial and friendly, you had the, it wasn't, wasn't going to be an investment. Right. So, yeah, that one. And, and that, here we are. That's right. Uh, that's yeah, right. Yeah. So, so what, uh, what question haven't I asked that I should? What, what, what do you want people to know about? Or? I, I would, if, if I was asking the questions. Which I'll, you're not, just I'm to be clear. Not, I mean, it's, I'm asking I'm the questions here, buddy. Beer <laughs> and, and embarrassing myself about my answers. Um, no, one of the things is how, if I was an insure, an insure tech entrepreneur, what are the things that I need to say to the investor, at least to get their attention, right? And the previous panel, which was interesting, there was three companies that we have already seen and that are in our pipeline. So, and we haven't invested yet. And the thing is, again, this business is about creating relationships. You will not get funding in the second meeting. And right now, something we need to see as investors is traction. Traction is the name of the game for us. Why is that? Because we need to invest in a company that can grow significantly, uh, very quick, so that at some point, we either get an additional investment or we sell, uh, the company, and we create economic value for us. Right now, we are not in a point in which we are going to support the company just to have a little traction. Mm -hmm. That is not what we do. There are, there are other you know, friends and family, and you have uh, seed funds, and you have other things. But I think it can be really frustrating just going to the investors, presenting a sound business case, and not getting the check. And my message to, the, to, to these guys is keep going, keep getting us informed about what's happening, uh, visit us as soon as, uh, as, you know, every now and then, every two months, send a newsletter, be present, because that is where everything starts. And um, I think it's the best time to do InsureTech because you have all the learnings, you have all the data, you have the, the artificial intelligence, you have machine learning, you have so many things that, that give arguments for that business to be successful, uh, different to 10 years ago, it's just a question of, of keep trying, keep trying, keep trying, and building relationships. Yeah, and, and there's two types of traction you're really referring to, I think. Yeah. One is the absolute traction. Here's where our metrics are, look at this, here's how we've grown. And then there's traction compared to what you said you were going to That's do. That's very important. Right, so you show me a company where you said you were going to grow by 
uh, 200%, and you ended up growing by 210%. Mm -hmm. I actually like that more than the company that said they were going to grow by 300%, but they only grew by 240%. Correct. Better absolute growth rate, yeah. but it's not as much in control. I can't believe that they're uh, going to do what they say they're going to do. I agree. So with that, and one more swig, I think our time is up. Yeah. So, salute. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much. Gracias.